connecting them. So we're gonna we're gonna start now and welcome. This is uh, Brian Harris, Independent Black Voters on Facebook as we continue our series of getting to know the candidates. It's our belief that we must be informed voters. We must choose what's good for our community, regardless of uh, political beliefs, values, et cetera. So today we have Senator Pat Spearman here. Uh, how you doing? And she is running for North Las Vegas mayor. So we're gonna start off by letting you give us an intro, tell us a little bit about you, uh, tell me a little bit of what the roles and the responsibilities are of the mayor of North Las Vegas, and we'll go from there. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, and again, th thank you for the opportunity. I, uh, uh, State Senator Pat Spearman, I have um, been a senator since 2012, and I, <clears throat> excuse me, currently serve um, as the chair of Commerce and Labor, vice chair for Health and Human Services, and I'm on the Education Committee. And I've chaired a number of other committees over the course of time. Uh, also uh, a member of West Trends for the uh, Council of State Governments. Uh, I'm on the Energy uh, Energy Supply Task Force for the National Conference of State Legislators. I am the chaplain for the National Black Caucus of State Legislators. And let me let me let me dispense with all of that other stuff. But I just that's just to let you know I've been active. Um, I am, I'm running for mayor for just really one reason. I'm also a um, uh, retired lieutenant colonel. Uh, and the only reason that I am running for mayor is because I believe this is a time that the uh, residents of North Las Vegas need clear, concise, and transparent leadership. We are in a crisis right now. And, and the, the crisis, the affordable housing crisis, has been exacerbated by a number of, uh, of events uh, that have taken place over the last uh, 18 months, if you will. Uh, some of that has been because we have people who have been furloughed, who've been laid off. Some people have lost their jobs. Those jobs aren't coming back. Uh, and then we have the, the spectacle of landlords uh, raising the rent for apparently no good reason. Um, and I, I tell this story often a few months ago, I had a uh, had a lady who's seventy two years old, who called me and said she um, she she remembered uh, she I came to her church and I spoke and she remembered me uh, and she had the, um, the the piece of paper that I gave her said you know contact me if you ever need me. Her she has her only income is social security, and that's less than two thousand dollars a month, and where she is currently living. Um, I think she said it was rent has been like 900. It was less than a thousand, but her current um, income was enough for her to eke out a comfortable living. She got a uh, letter indicating that the landlord is going to increase the rent to $1,200. And she said, um, Senator, I don't, she said, I can't afford it. I can't afford it. And I can't afford to move someplace. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do. And that's, that's just a, a, a snippet of the kinds of calls and the kinds of emails that I've gotten uh, over the last year or so. Um, I was able to help her um, get something done about that. Um, and everybody who's contacted me in one way or another, I've tried to help them out. Some people, there was really nothing I could do. There's nothing I could do to save um, their rental property. Um, uh, some people had had a house sold from under them, and they didn't know until they got a notice on their on their door. And so, this affordable housing crisis is really now at a peak. <clears throat> what I want to do as mayor is I want to make sure that we're focusing first of all, first and foremost, we have got to make sure that any resources we have that will allow us to develop either new housing or refurbished house, houses that are already in existence, we've got to do whatever we can do to make sure that there is affordable housing in North Las Vegas. Uh, we've got something called private activity bonds. And what that does is if uh, someone wants to build um, low income uh, housing uh, and they get tax credits for it, that that private activity uh, bond is what they what the city uses to offset whatever the tax uh, rebates would be. I think we ought to use that. 
I think we ought to look at what the ARPA funds are and make sure that we are, if there are any, if there's any possibility of us using some of those funds to make sure that we have affordable housing. And I'm spending a lot of time on this because we have people who literally, literally are in their cars sleeping in the park, sleeping in the park. And I think that it is obscene for any government entity that has an opportunity to address this situation, not to do so, not to do so. Um, and I think it was like maybe two weeks ago, city council met, culinary union uh, got uh, in excess, in excess of what the signatures that they needed to put this ballot initiative forward, let the people vote on it. And the city council rejected it. What? Rejected it. And and they rejected it saying, that, say they had something about, you know, it was not the right, um, they were trying to use the primary when clearly the law says the last general election, which would have been 2020, okay? Um, and so outright just rejected it. And, and all the initiative was saying, these are the things we want to see happen so that people will be able to afford where they live. That's all it said. It didn't say you have to do it. It said, this is what we are asking the people to vote on. So affordable housing is the first thing. I also wanna be mayor, the next mayor of North Las Vegas because I think we have a tremendous opportunity uh, with respect to some of the land. We are the only city in Clark County uh, that's not la landlocked. So we have an opportunity to, to recruit businesses to come to North Las Vegas that will pay in excess of 20, sometimes $30, $35 an hour in the tech industry, in, uh, in, in the chip industry, in uh, renewable energy, all of those things. We've got an opportunity to do that. And I know because I've got the relationships not just here, but the relationships be with uh, the work that I've done at the national level, I've got the relationships to talk to them, to bring that to pass. And when we do that, we're talking about giving the citizens, the residents of North Las Vegas an opportunity to have a good paying job, a good paying job so that they can rise above, quote, being renters, but also make sure that they, they, can, they have an opportunity to become homeowners. I, I want to be the next mayor of North Las Vegas because I believe it's time out for neglecting some communities and 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 then respecting others over them. I, I think what is happening in uh, the more mature part of North Las Vegas with respect to um, zoning, uh, with respect to some of the um, neighborhoods there that are are being rezoned from residential to either commercial or light industrial without without the, the, the benefit of, the, of the, the neighbors being able to say something about it. Those are the things that, that immediately come to mind. And that's why I really, it, it took me a long time to, 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 to decide to do this. But those are just some of the things that I, that I wanna do. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking because, you know, listen, Mr. Harris, I, <sighs> this election could not be more clear. The choice could not be any clearer, could not be any clearer. We will either move forward in a direction where every neighborhood is respected and not neglected. We will move forward uh, with, a, with an agenda that includes bringing innovation and technology to the city. We will move forward where we have a focus on affordable housing. We will move forward and make sure that we've got a medical corridor. We will move forward and make sure that government is transparent through and through. We will either move forward with that with me or people can stay with the status quo. And I, I, I just don't think that people want to do that. I really don't. Well, thank you for that introduction and, and, and going out. So I'm going to go back and ask you some questions um, mm -hmm. because, you know, it's, it's interesting that I see, uh, Right now, one of the uh, major, I'm sorry, uh, mm -hmm. let me turn that off here. One of the major issues is housing. Mm -hmm. And many times people talk about uh, affordable housing for the poor. Mm -hmm. And it seems like they're ignoring affordable housing for the people who want to be middle class yeah. and want to stay middle class. So mm -hmm. uh, I talk about that issue first because uh, your opinion right now, corporate America is disproportionately purchasing homes, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. not just in North Las Vegas, but across the board. Across the and, country. 
across the country. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Give me your thoughts on how in North Las Vegas that can be uh, combated or reduced because I know for a fact there have been subdivisions in North Las Vegas which were purchased 100% by investors without the opportunity for um, a person who wanted to buy it to live in it Mm -hmm. even having the opportunity mm -hmm. to purchase so it will be very difficult to go backwards but here's what i can tell you and 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 this is the sole duty of the mayor the mayor is supposed to lead the city council in measures to help the residents of north las vegas to have a more productive safe uh secure successful life that's the job of the mayor to lead okay to lead. You can't lead without a vision. And so when I talk about affordable housing, I know that there are some people whose income is more than 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 what the cutoff score is for any type of public assistance assistance, but it's below what they need to survive. And so I'm looking at let's let's take a look at, at what the when when people come and say we're gonna build another 500 houses. Hmm, okay. One of the things that the mayor and the city council can do is to say, we're going to step back. And if you're going to put 500 houses or 500 homes in this development, then a certain percentage of them must be for low to moderate income individuals. There's nothing we can do about who comes in and buys. The only thing that we can do right now is to make sure that people understand when you get a call and I get I get calls almost every day. Somebody asking me, do you want to sell your house? No, no, I don't want to sell it. So there's not a lot we can do about what's happening right now, but I know that moving forward, we can do that. And the jobs that I'm talking about are really careers. You, you give someone a job making $25 an hour at plus benefits. And, and when you look at benefits, be, benefits are about or half, usually 50% of whatever that is. So $25 an hour and half of that is $12.50. So actually what you're talking about is someone making 37, the equivalent of $37.50 an hour. Get people to work in those types of careers that will be around for a while. Now what we've done is we've lifted them out of poverty and we've provided an opportunity for them to be the ones who are purchasing homes. I think a lot of this has to do with what we do with planning and zoning and what we really do Pink when it comes to lost. what we do, what we do when it comes to making sure that all of the land that is used, make sure that that is used in a way that benefits the citizens of North Las Vegas. And right now, we're not doing that. We're not doing that at all. OK, uh, and I'm going I want to go back because on the housing there's a there's there was just uh, part of that moratorium or, or the questionnaire I think was mm -hmm. whether or not to have uh, rent control is that yes. correct yes yes oh, okay. it was a cap that okay. that would be that would be tied that would be tied to um, inflation I think it was okay mm -hmm. and you were for that happening correct yeah I was yes and and here's here's what I say now I don't know why the city council didn't let it go forward because the only thing that the petition was saying is let the people decide. Mm -hmm. Let the people decide. And and I'm a firm believer that in this environment, if you put something like that forward to the people, they would decide that we need to cap some of the increases because people cannot pay their rent. Their rent. And, and Mr. Harris, and let, let me say this, because this is something else that just just blew my mind. OK, in the midst of this affordable housing crisis. The mayor decides we're going to talk about building a downtown North Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Sit on that for a minute. And it's, it's going to have retail shops. And I'm thinking, you got people right now who can't pay their rent and who can't buy a loaf of bread. If I can't buy a loaf of bread, I can't go to the Gucci store. Mm -hmm. let, let, let's, 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 let's focus on what the important things are right now. And I think the people should have had an opportunity to vote on that measure. We have we have we have have initiate initiatives coming forward all the time at every level of government. We've had several of them uh, since I've been in the city in the Senate. When when the citizens sign those petitions, when they meet the legal requirements, those petitions should go forward. And it's an opportunity for people to make a decision about how their lives will continue. OK, uh, again, and I appreciate that. It, that's an interesting story or uh, interesting 
question. I understand you say the people should make that decision. Yes. Um, and, and I'm torn in the situation. As I said, I, I focus on affordable housing mm -hmm. in a different light. And, I, you know, again, I asked the question. Uh, I know you said there's no way, but uh, there have been certain areas. I live in Henderson, to give you mm -hmm. an example. Mm -hmm. Many of our associations are making rules that so that if you are not physically living in that area, uh, then you cannot be a renter to kind of curb it. Uh, we can push at increased uh, increased taxes to the point where, you know, if you have over a certain amount of them, it becomes uh, not a great return on my investment. There mm -hmm. are ways that um, I can say from the from 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 local mm -hmm. to state to federal government that laws can be changed to make it unattractive to uh, corporations mm -hmm. to be in this market. And yeah, so, and, yeah. So, give me yeah. your thoughts there. Yeah, and, and and I will I will agree with you um, that there are things that can be done. Um, through changing statutes and ordinances. Um, where we are right now with the current administration in North Las Vegas, that's not gonna happen. If they would not let a simple initiative go forward, they will not entertain anything else. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with how they do that in Henderson, but I am always willing to learn. And if there is a way for us to make sure that it is um, not as desirable for people to to uh, get um, a lot loss. of a lot of um, homes to buy up a lot of homes so that they control the market. If there's a way for us to do that, I'm certainly open to that because I think, as I said before, people people have got to have shelter, and some of the people this this is the obscene part. Some of the people who are homeless or housing insecure are veterans, mm -hmm. are veterans. And veteran and homelessness should never be in the same in the same sentence. And, and I'm talking about not just, quote, low income, but I'm talking about low to moderate income. I'm talking about making this available and accessible to all people. And by the way, let me uh, tell you about a, a bill that I had last session in 21 that allows people who are currently receiving some type of uh, government assistance to have a separate account that does not count against their benefits. It's called an individual development account. And the way the bill was written, the treasurer who has now crafted what the, 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 the rules and the regulations to do that, what it says is that people can put money in this IDA, this individual development account, they can put money in there to save up, to buy a home, uh, to start a small business, uh, to pay off some debts that are keeping them from buying a home. But the other and the other group that, that it benefits is foster children, because those who age out in the foster care system, one minute past midnight on their 18th birthday, they're out of the system and they have nothing. And so it also allows the, the, the foster child, foster parents, somebody who is concerned about them, somebody to put money in these accounts, and it doesn't count against the benefits. That's one of the things that I did while in the Senate. And I know that if we use that, along with some of the things that, um, uh, that, that you just mentioned, I know that we can solve this problem. I, listen, whatever we can do, I'm open to it because I know people are hurting. I know people are hurting. And, 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 and if we don't have a place to live, then the rest of our lives just fall apart. Okay. Just fall apart. Okay. Um, let me ask you this question because, again, uh, North Las Vegas was the first uh, predominantly minority majority mm -hmm. uh, with, I guess I just found out, Las Vegas is now majority minority. Uh, when you look at the governmental mix of people who are running the government, it's completely opposite. How do we get serious inclusion <clears throat> and make sure that the cities that are being now uh, majority minority reflect the values, the beliefs, and the opportunities, including uh, not just jobs, Mm -hmm. But as the economic growth happens, 
how do they make sure that they're not left out the table as it ha has happened in the mm -hmm. past. So one of the things that I had pledged to do is um, make sure that we institute a diversity audit. Uh, because it's not just the people who are not uh, getting information about job openings. It's also, we don't have a diverse supply chain, meaning that the, 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 the businesses that the city, uh, the companies that the city does business with is not diverse at all. And Go so, the, so, so, so the diversity audit will do a couple of things. Number one, it will give us a baseline as to where we are. We'll be able to look at that and say, hmm, so how are we recruiting when there is an opening coming up or when there is a vacancy? How are we recruiting and how wide a net are we casting for that? And I believe one of the things that the mayor can do, along with the city council, is to make sure it has to be mandated that the net is cast far and wide so that we have a diverse uh, pool of candidates. Now, you know, one of the things that, that and it's always humorous a little bit, that, that people say, well, well, you know, we couldn't find any women or or we couldn't find any black candidates or we couldn't find any Latino. And, and so I said, where did you look? Where did you look? Well, we posted it on the wall, you know, uh, down at City Hall and where everybody could see it. OK, if anybody didn't come to City Hall, then that means they didn't see it. OK. And so when I talk about about casting a, a, a wide net, I'm talking about every available venue, making sure that people have that. You are correct. The, the people who now are in jobs and positions, in, and let me just deal with North Las Vegas, I truly don't believe that they are representative of the people who pay the salaries. But we have to know, we have to know what is going on right now. And then from there, craft personnel policies that require, that indeed demand that the pool of candidates be as diverse as possible. And that means casting a wider net. Okay. And I hope uh, that, that answered your question. Uh, for the most part, it did. The, uh, you know, because, and I, I guess I'm going to go back and say uh, that sounds good all the time, but I, I look back Right now, there's on the books to look at the amount of people by race on mm -hmm. any government jobs that were deal dealing with construction. Mm -hmm. They don't even look at it. It's a rule, but nobody looks at it, nor mm -hmm. do they do anything to resolve it. Just mm -hmm. as you said, uh, during even the monies that went to the uh, stadium, mm -hmm. uh, there was a community benefits, and the benefit to my community was dismal at best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it sounds good. We just want to see it happen. But let me ask you this other can, can I Can I address that for just a minute? Uh -huh. um, and, and, and as I said before, here's the way it happens. We have passed some really good bills that deal with supply chain diversity. And we even passed a bill, and I'm not going to quote the numbers because I will probably get them wrong, but allows, um, like some, some small businesses can't get uh, a project because they don't have enough money to get bonded. OK. And so a few sessions ago, we, we passed a bill that they could they could use the bonding um, uh, ability of a larger firm to get that and, and, and encourage those larger firms to make sure that they were bringing them along. So so number one, what is not inspected is neglected. The diversity audit will tell us exactly where we are. It's not enough to say, well, yeah, we've got 40% uh, of our workforce are, are women. How do we know that? And, and, and what jobs are they in? Are we talking about people who are actually at the decision-making table? Or are we talking about uh, the, the, the contractors that, 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 that clean around and, and do the landscaping? Are we what are we talking about? But well, we've got to do that diversity audit. And, and once we do that diversity audit, and that has got to be public, and then we've got to make sure, as I said before, we have to have a recruiting plan that casts a wide net and then hold us accountable. Hold us accountable. Okay. If we don't do that, hold us accountable. OK, we will. Uh, let me ask you something. North Las Vegas obviously has probably uh, one of the highest concentration of African-Americans. Uh, Disproportionately, the homeless are African Americans. Uh, many people tend to to try to make it look like it's all drugs and and such. When uh, the working poor, 
just as I said, we're disproportionately we're disproportionately in the lower economic jobs, and people are choosing between having a roof over their head mm -hmm. or not living. How how do you think that again? Uh, North, affordable housing isn't here, but mm -hmm. the uh, the homelessness is here, mm -hmm. and it's bludgeoning, getting bigger and bigger. How do you think the North Las Vegas will be able or should be able to handle this rising issue that uh, it's like as it rises, the water falls. So mm -hmm. how do we how do we address this issue now to try to address? I always tell people the tsunami that's about to hit. Um, and so one of the things that I worked on every session uh, while in the Senate is trying to get more money to our uh, for mental health. Uh, the other thing that that we should be doing, and that is making sure that housing, if it's not here right now, how do we get it here? The, the, the homeless. Homeless people are. Are not just. Addicts. And they're not just those who have mental issues. And I've, I've worked with Sandra Cosgrove, um, like I said, just about every session uh, since I've been in the, in the uh, Senate to, to try to address this problem. I think what we have to do is, and I'll go back to the affordable, affordable housing piece. We have the low income housing tax credits, okay? That is a federal program. Making sure that people who step up and say, I want a tax credit and I'm going to build uh, this affordable housing development. You can say that, but if you don't go back and check that, nobody knows if you did it or not, right? And so there are some tools that are available to us right now. The housing issue is not going to get better on its own. And I don't think that there's a silver bullet, but I think a combination of things, I think making sure that we increase the affordable housing, housing units and making sure that we have good jobs, good jobs, not just for people who want to work for someone, but it also creates an opportunity for entrepreneurs. The other thing that I, I believe that we've got to do is we've got to make sure that uh, our the medical issues are addressed, which is why if you look at my website, I have on there creating a medical corridor. And that's not just geographic, it's also it's also virtual. I want to make sure that we have the resources focused in a place so that whenever, wherever people need that information, they can go and they can get it. There's no silver bullet. I wish I had a, a magic wand, but I don't. But I, I, I believe that using what we already have with respect to tax credit, using what we have already when people come and they want to permit to build uh, a, a new development, we can, we can attach some parameters on that. And I do believe that the initiative that Culinary Union uh, brought forward, I think that the people need to be given an opportunity to vote on that. Okay. And I'm, ask, I'm just trying to be real uh, with you, okay? Okay, I am. I mean, I, I expect you to. Um, just recently, and I, and I believe, hopefully I say this correctly, uh, there were some uh, uh, tiny homes or whatever that were just taken down and removed in North <laughs> Las Vegas, uh, Obviously, it's a catch-22 when you come to housing the poor or the homeless because everybody wants to do it, but not my neighborhood, mm -hmm. not my backyard, not mm -hmm. here, not there. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we deal our 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 tiny homes are uh, what how are we going to do this now? Because, again, credits are great, but the, the problems here today and. and mm -hmm. And literally, in a country as great as this is, and we we see people living under uh, overpasses, and as I said, disproportionately is black people, and it's mm -hmm. not always mental and drugs. Many of them mm -hmm. just cannot afford a place to live. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying right now, do we look at what do we what can we do right now? That's not necessarily tax credits, but initially, do we create some areas? Uh, I, I don't know the answer, just from the aspect of the mayor of North Las Vegas, this problem is going to get worse. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and uh, do you think little home, or what do they call them, tiny homes, do you tiny think homes, yeah. some type of uh, developments, even if they're temporary developments, are needed 
to basically at least try to temp, uh, stem the, the tide of homelessness that's coming here, that's here, not even coming, mm -hmm. it's already here. Yeah. So you're, it, you're right, it is a catch-22. Affordable housing for me is not just a unit that's 900 square feet. And I know something is better than nothing, but what I want to focus on is number one, do we have anything that exists right now? And I don't know if you saw the interview that I did with Channel 8 uh, with respect to uh, recommendations for stations, casinos, mm -hmm. uh, with the, with uh, they, they're they going to sell the property, the Texas station and the Fiesta. My recommendation to them was don't sell it, refurbish it and use it for housing, especially for women veterans and for women with children. Use it for some of the most vulnerable people in our, in our, in our community. Make sure that as you use that, make sure that there are opportunities for uh, learning new skills, new trades inside that. And the people who live there, we can keep the theater open. We can keep the bowling alley open. We can keep the cafeterias or the restaurants open. And those are ways that the people immediately can have a job. What I'd like to do is instead of focusing on units that are just 900 square feet, again, I want to take inventory. What do we have here right now? And, and there may be some, some duplexes, there may be some apartment buildings, there may be, there may be some single family homes that we can take some of those low income tax, uh, 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 low income housing tax credits and use those as an incentive for current owners to convert to some type of low income or moderate income housing. There's no silver bullet, but I am willing to sit down to the table with people who are, are a lot smarter than me and say, these are some of my ideas. Tell me what you think will work. And if it's not going to work, tell me what will. Let's get together and let's look at this because ignoring the problem, which is what is happening right now, it's not going to go away. Yes, I agree. It's now, not going to go away. Now, first of all, I want to say something. Thank you for your service as a veteran. I respect all veterans. Thank you. Uh, yeah, but I do have a, a little bit of an issue that I have to state. Mm -hmm. Right now, Black men are very much upset because while I believe veterans should have housing, I truthfully believe that veterans do not have a step up to have housing over another person. I think we need to address the hall over everywhere. While I believe that women and women in need should, but when you look at the incarceration of Black men, the unemployment and the high men, it sounds good to say women, it sounds good to say veterans, but the folks who I believe are probably taking the blunt of everything, and I'm talking about black men have the highest amount of car incarceration. They have the lowest amount of employment. It sounds good when everybody talks about taking care of everybody else. And I, I encourage you and I'm encouraging all of the folks Stop thinking we're going to shake our heads and think that's great to talk about everybody but us. That is really something that is starting to grate on me. And as I talk mm -hmm. to other Black men, it grates on us that we're asked, just as they did in, in other places, to celebrate everybody else's success while we see our demise. So that's just a commentary to please yeah. think about, because uh, there is a void there that... Uh, is getting bigger because I tell people, America is only strong as this weakest link. That. And mm -hmm. if black people are part of, if black men are part of that weakest link, then they should be as important and discussed as much as everybody else, including veterans, including women, including everybody else. But that's not a tough topic that people are feel comfortable about discussing. Uh, so your thoughts there? Yeah. So yeah. So I'm 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 comfortable in discussing that. When I think about veterans, my last assignment was at the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And I was there during the height of the Iraqi and Afghanistan wars. And I know what many of our, especially combat veterans have gone through, and it's not just men, but it's also women. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're black and, and, and the military now, especially the army has more um, BIPOC folks in there who are listed and, and when you stop and you go up and you look at the VA, there are a lot of black men who are getting services from the VA. So please don't hear when I say, when I say specifically veterans that I'm excluding anyone else, but I mentioned veterans because I saw what they went through in war. 
And yeah. I know and and I know that most of the time, if you don't mention them, it's a forgotten lot. Now, do are there some things that we should be doing for the formerly incarcerated? Yes. Yes. When I talk about talk about fixing the affordable housing crisis, I'm not leaving anybody out. But I have to say veterans because I need people to keep that on their mind. And for women veterans, especially every 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 housing project that has been done in the county, in the state and across the nation has always been done based upon the needs of male veterans. But we have women veterans who have children, women veterans who they're not not going to go and they're not going to live in a place where they are. And so if I don't mention them, then I've done a disservice to the brothers and sisters that, that I've served with. So please don't hear that is as, as exclusionary, but I've got to mention them. Oh, and absolutely. I've got to make sure that we're we're including everybody. I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm not segmenting and and I, I'm not I'm not quote prioritizing, but I've got to mention them because we cannot forget them. Some of them are walking amongst us now. Some black men, and I know that that's right. Some black men right now are are dealing with depression because of issues related to their service. A lot of black men are dealing with that, and mm -hmm. so uh, fixing it means means again. Let's look at the problem. Let's look at the resources that we have and let's get to work pulling the resources together and whatever we don't have, let's figure out how we get it and let's make sure that we get it done. But I have to, have to always mention veterans. Absolutely. And as I said, I'm not saying don't. I'm yeah. not, uh, believe me, that's why I started off to say thank you for your service. And that's mm -hmm. why I say I have the much love and support for veterans because they are the ones that have kept our democracy going. But I'm also saying, I need for people to step up and include black men in the discussion the way they include everybody else. So this is not just to you, this is to yeah, everyone. Yeah. We're tired of everybody else appearing to be, because they're prioritized if they're discussed, just as you said. If you talk about them, it keeps the priority up. Well, when it comes to black men, it's almost like don't discuss them, don't discuss the fact that the, the war on drugs disproportionately hit black men, especially. You don't look on the fact that when you look at discrimination and opportunity disproportionately now, black men are at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to opportunity for a lot of reasons. So no, I, 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 I'm not disparaging that. I believe you should continue to talk about veterans, about women, mm -hmm. about everybody, but I believe that it's time for men to be in the discussion to black men because mm -hmm. you know we have borne the, a lot of the blunt of the civil rights movement we have borne a lot of the blunt of many of the things that have made everybody's groups better for, through the civil rights movement but yet now it seems like the discussion about us <clears throat> is secondary third or never discussed so i just wanted to make that yeah. clear because it's important that people you know, when I, I just tell you, when I hear everybody else mentioned in a room, but the but folks who look like me, like mm -hmm. men, it kind of concerns me because it feels like I'm opening the door for everybody else and clapping for their success. So yeah. I just throw I that understand out. That. It's yeah, something I understand. That thinking about because most, sure. I'm saying all the politicians love to talk about veterans. They love to talk about women. They love to talk about children. Uh, but they don't look at the catastrophic issues coming because here's another fact: homelessness is going to be it's going black men are probably hit the hardest of homelessness because you've got a section segment of people who were incarcerated. If you've been incarcerated for most of your adult life, you don't get the money for social security. You're now put out on the street. You don't have the 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 the, the, the help for anything. So you're homeless not because you're mentally ill. Not because of this, you've got a record to go behind you. You've got all the other issues that are confronting you. Like I said, the war on drugs, we took now uh, millionaires. We have white millionaires who are making tons of money while a lot of my black men who set up the infrastructure have been in jail mm -hmm. and through systemic racism have mm -hmm. been driven out of even the opportunity to mm -hmm. be in the industry that they created as far mm -hmm. as putting the platform. So mm -hmm. I just ask that we at least have a little more empathy to, to, to the black men 
in the uh, and, and a lot of the trials and tribulations that we are going to because they are just as important in every other group. But I um, hear you and I receive that. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, now going back, uh, as I said, um, water. Tell me about this because, in <laughs> my opinion. <laughs> Luckily, we got a lot of rain this uh, last couple of weeks, but not enough. Um, it's water. It's it's almost like it's been. It's like the government is not admitting how much trouble we are in from the whole perspective of right now growth here in Nevada. Along, it's it's a direct correlation between growth and and and, uh, and water, and we're going to be at a point if we don't address this issue, instead of just basically nibbling around the edges, where well, water could be the destruction of, of Southern Nevada. What are your thoughts on the whole water issue and what do you think we need to do? Do we need to even, even consider mandates on growth? Uh, it's funny, we need more housing, but maybe we don't need more housing if it's bringing more people in. So I don't know the answer, I just want your opinion on it. Mm -hmm. So, Remember earlier I said it's not a silver bullet? Yep. Um, one of the things that should have been done was when you make, and most cities do this anyway, they have a five, 10, and 30 year plan. One of the things that should have been done with all of the vacant land that was north of Craig is to sit down and say, what would be the infrastructure needed if we put X number of houses? If we don't put houses there, what can we do that will improve the quality of life for the people here? That was not done. That was not done. The other thing with respect to uh, water issues, um, a lot of that has to do with the uh, vicissitudes of climate change. And we have not really addressed that. One of the things that, that I have championed in the state Senate is every Every energy bill that you see that has been passed since I've been in the Senate has my name on it somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm either the primary sponsor, primary co-sponsor, or I supported it or whatever. It's a comprehensive, comprehensive planning mm -hmm. because the things that we're talking about are segments of the bigger problem that we face. And we can't deal with one without dealing with the other. But we can't deal, we, we can't do that by saying, well, I'm going to deal with A and then we'll come back and do the rest of it in December and then we'll do C in, you know, April of next year. No, no, we've got to sit down to the table with the stockholders and the stakeholders and let's look at the problems that we have and come up with comprehensive solutions. And that's not going to be overnight. But here's my proposition. My proposition is this. Move the city council meetings from four o'clock in the afternoon when most people are working move that to a more acceptable hour of something like six. And let's make sure that it's online. Let's make sure if we have to, you know, get something through Hulu, whatever we have to do so that it's available for people to see what's going on in their government and to be able to comment on that. And so the, 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 price, the, the prices that we face right now, part of the issue is we have an administration that is basically look the other way. Look the other way. These are serious problems that requires serious solutions. I have no illusions, none, no illusions that this will be done within the first two years uh, as, as my, uh, while I'm mayor, I no illusions. But what I do know is that if we get to work tackling this right now and get some smart people involved in the discussions, and I'm, when I say smart people involved, you know what, Mr. Harris, I'm gonna invite you. I'm gonna invite you once I become mayor, Please come to my office. Let's talk about some more of these things. And let's get some other people that you know to talk about some more of these things. Let's get a community conversation going about not just the issues, but some of the some of the 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 the, the things that you think we can the do. Solutions. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And 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 anybody that has dealt with me in, in the Senate knows that I am an open-minded person. There, there are bills that come through in commerce and labor and commerce and labor, everything that deals with commerce in the state to include insurance rates. And that's whether it's property insurance or health insurance, well, all of that comes through through my committee. And I've always, when people ask me about a bill that is coming before my committee, when they sit down in the chair across from me, across from my desk, first thing I ask them is who's against it? 
and why? And whoever the people are that are against it, I bring them in. Why are you against this? And what would make it better? And I get both of the people together. And by the time the bill leaves, it may not be what, what the person who sponsored it initially wanted, but we have a bill that is crafted that we at least we can move forward and we can make incremental change if that's all we can do. And then we just keep making that kind of change. But but I know that if we continue doing the same thing we're doing, this this race right now is a clear choice. Do you want to continue doing what has always been done that frankly ain't working for us? No kind of way, no kind of way. It ain't working for us. Do you want to continue doing that? Or do you want something different? And, and, and to be sure, I respect what the councilwoman's family has given to North Las Vegas and the what they've done for the state. I respect that. I respect that. But where we are right now, even using the tool of Facebook, we're using parts of an international innovative, innovative system. So we can't just look at North Las Vegas. We've got to expand to look at not just not just across the country, but across the world. And that's all I'm asking. I'm saying let's move forward, but we can't move forward doing the same thing that we've always done. It can't happen. Great. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We have, because uh, I try to keep it to this, and I thank you. I know you're a busy person, first of all. Uh, I'm going to let you take it home, but I want you to give me the the bridge version we america's in trouble right now um you know i'm a 60s baby 1960 mm -hmm. and i have never seen the, the the division that i'm seeing today uh as a black man one of my concerns is the rise of white nationalism mm -hmm. i believe it's the it's the precursor to fascism i believe that it's something that needs to be talked at i think it needs to be educated because I think uh, misinformation, if people understand historically, was used by Hitler to great fascism. And it looks like we're headed in the same direction. Just give us a shirt. What, what do you think? And, and how do you think we can kind of address it and come together as one America? If you don't face it, you can't fix it. Yeah. And the one thing that's happening uh, in different pockets of government, is there some people acting like it's okay? Mm -hmm. It's okay. The other thing that I've done since being in the Senate is to work on bills about equality and equity. Mm -hmm. And and had my colleagues to face some hard realities, some hard realities. The diversity audit that I talked about I can almost guarantee, at least 90% guarantee, that when we get the results of that audit, not just for this year, but if we go 10 years back, I can almost guarantee you that the segments of the population who now are suffering, disproportionately suffering economically, I can almost guarantee you that they're absent. Almost guarantee you that. When we talk about the rise of, of white nationalism, I'm not afraid to do that. I'm not afraid to do that. And I also am not afraid to confront it. When we talked about voting rights, I was very clear in the Senate when, <clears throat> when in 2020, when we had the special session and talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about uh, mail-in ballots and those sorts of things. And my colleagues on the other side of the aisle were, were trying to say, well, we're going to, we, that, what that does is that leaves room for fraud and everything. I said, you know, and I was real clear when I said to them, nobody talked about fraud in voting until Barack Obama was, was elected. Now, let's be clear about that, okay? The other thing that I said is that voting is a is a sacred right. And I talked about the fact that I am only third generation free. When I was in Uganda, I was asked by someone, what generation free are you? And quite frankly, I had never thought of it. And I had to think about it. My grandmother was barely born free. She was born about 20 years after the emancipation. My dad was born free and I was born free. But check it out. I am the I am the first generation that, that has been born into the expectation that voting will happen for me regardless of my color, regardless of, of my gender. OK, and so when it comes to equality and equity, you, you, you don't want to tangle with me on that. 
I'm not afraid to call it what it is. And a lot of what's happening with the misinformation and the disinformation is because people recognize that those communities that have been marginalized, if they can dispirit those communities, if they can make, make them think your vote doesn't count, if they can make you think it's already, it's already done, if they can make them think all of that, then, then they can continue to do what they do. What I want to do is bring more people into the discussion. That's what I want to do. And when we talk about talk about confronting white nationalism, there was a there was a uh, a, a, a ballot question uh, in 2020 that dealt with HAVA, Help America Vote Act. And I don't know how many people when they walk into the polling place, uh, you could see a list of about 13 things you have a right to. You have a right to. You have a right to. Mm -hmm. Well, th that was statute. After after the Supreme Court's decision in 2013. I called our legal folks and I put together a bill that would that would make sure that voting was protected in Nevada. The bill was out in 15, but the Republicans controlled the legislature, so they didn't hear it. I brought it back in 17. I brought it back in 19 because to change the Constitution, you ha it has to pass two consecutive legislature legislative sessions. OK, brought it back in 17, brought it back in 19 and it passed. I didn't say a whole lot about it. I didn't make a whole lot of fanfare about it, but but it passed on the ballot. Question four, question four in 2020 was a bill that I carried from 15, 17 and 19 to make sure that the, the properties that were available to us under have HAVA, the statutes are now in our constitution. Those are the things that I think we have to do when we start talking about confronting it. We've got to make sure we face the problem head on and, and, and we can't talk about it in pretty terms. This is what it is. This is what it is. And as a veteran, I'm offended. I am offended when people talk about January the 6th as though it was just a stroll in the park. Mm -hmm. It was an attack on our government. That's what it was. I'm not afraid. And, and, and I'm already retired. I'm a black woman. Uh, I've lived as a black woman and I'm proud about it. Everything that I have that I've achieved right now in my life, I've had to fight for. My first day in the military, in, in officer basic, my first day, I had one of the teachers go around the room and talk about how hard the course was going to be and stand there in front of my desk and lean down and look at me and say, everybody's not going to make it through graduation. And I turned to the person sitting next to me. I said, he's not talking about me. They made everything that I did harder than anybody else. Through my career, I, I've had to be more, do more than any other person in the military. The, it, as a woman, as a black woman, and in the military police corps, there was a lot of racism and a lot of prejudice. I had to do more and be more. And so right now, I, I have very little tolerance for racial discrimination, any type of ethnic discrimination, linguistic discrimination, gender discrimination, fill in the blank discrimination. I've got a very low tolerance for that. And wherever I see it, I'm not afraid to address it. I'm not afraid to root it out. And I'm not afraid to gather people with me to make sure that the people's voice is heard and the people who are perpetuating that understand that for, from the people's point of view, we ain't having it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're gonna, I'm trying to fill on time. So thank you very much because I'm gonna have you close it out. But I do have one quick, because you it brought up, there is gonna be a ballot issue on uh, open primaries. Mm -hmm. Are you for or against open primaries and why? Just as quick, not, not a long one, yeah. but so I can. So I, I think that there, right now, I can't say that there is a, a definite yes or a definite no. But here's what I think happens in open primaries. People who are nonpartisan, the way it is right now, they're shut out of the primary system. OK, and if that will fix it, and I talked to um, gosh, I'm trying to remember the guy who is carrying that bill, but I've talked to him uh, about that. I think that that a system that allows everybody to participate in it. I think, yes, that is necessary. I think, yes, that, that is necessary. Here's what else I believe. If we're going to do open primaries, then I think people have to spend the time getting educated on who the candidates are and what they stand for. You know, one, one, one of the issues that, that we face when we start talking about inequality is the judicial system. But if you ask most people when they go into the voting booth, 
they have no idea who's running for judge. And, and so unless, with open with they, open unless they've come through the independent black voters, they know. Yeah, yeah, but but you but you understand what I'm saying. Yes. I'm 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 saying most people don't know. And so with that comes the responsibility to learn about the candidates, Absolutely. who they are and what they support. Okay? To learn and it's not just the candidate. I think it's important for you to know who supports them. Because whoever is supporting them, if if they are accepting that person's support, that means that they agree with the stance that that person has. OK, and and here's one of the things that the current the current mayor has said, has said he has he has said very blatantly that he doesn't want to leave the city in the hands of socialists. The current mayor is the same person who said to an accomplished professional who was trying to make their case as to why they should have been promoted and why their, 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 their application should have been given some type of consideration, who said to them, go back to Africa, okay? Now, as far as I'm concerned, not only do I not want his support, I don't need his support because I, 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 I disagree vehemently with everything that he stands for, everything. So when with the open primary comes the responsibility to look at the candidates Absolutely. and see what they're standing for and look at the people who are supporting them. And if someone is supporting them, that must mean that the candidate, the candidate agrees with them. OK, OK, well, again, we're towards the end. I want to keep it to an hour and I let you end it up. You've got three minutes here. I thank you uh, for taking the time because this will be posted on the independent black voters uh, to give people a chance to know who you are, what you are and what your values are. So now you got uh, two and a half minutes, two minutes okay. to take it home. So so here, here's why I want to I want to come home and be mayor, because I have helped people. Ninety four percent of my Senate district encompasses uh, North Las Vegas. OK. I, I, I have already helped people with a myriad problems and issues that they've had. I understand what the, what the residents are facing. I'm coming home because I want to use my legislative experience. I want to use my experience as a, as a pastor, as a former pastor. I want to use my experience as a military officer. I want to use all of my experience that I have gained participating at the national level. I want to make sure that I come home and that as the mayor and the leader of the council, I want to make sure that we're using every available resource that we have to make sure that the people who have lost their jobs, who have been displaced by technology, make sure that we are retraining, uptraining, giving them more skill sets. I want to use the, 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 all the, 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 the skill set that I've had and the information that I've had and that I've developed over, over my lifetime. I want to make sure that I'm using that to meet the needs of people, talk to people. I want to use that to bring people together. We might not always agree on everything, but we ought to always be able to talk to people about that. I want to use all of that experience so that we can create a North Las Vegas that is a world-class hub for business, business innovation, and business development. And that will include everybody. When we talk about expanding the job market, we talk about expanding economic development and economic opportunities. I'm talking about doing that with a concerted effort. I'm coming home to be mayor, not because I need the money, not because I need the prestige. I'm already retired. I'm coming home because I know we are standing right now on the precipice of greatness or status quo. And I'm coming home to be the next mayor of North Las Vegas because I reject the fact, I reject the notion that we cannot do better. We can do better, but we can only do that with visionary, transparent, skilled, competent, and unafraid, unafraid leadership. I'm all of those things. I need your vote to do it. I need your vote to do it. And that's all I'm asking. Give me a chance. Give me a chance. I've already worked with people who play the game. I already know what they do. I already know how they do it. I already know all of that. And so one of the things that I know is that people who want to keep things the same, one of the reasons that my candidacy scares them is because they know that I know them. OK, you're not going to spit in my face and tell me it's raining outside as your next mayor. I have developed the political skill to be able to operate in the system that for many, if you don't know how to do that, it will work against you. I need your vote. That's what I'm asking. I need your vote. Give me a chance to bring you into the conversation. Give me a chance to bring you into the solution making problem. Give me a chance. Give me a chance. And I promise you, if you give me a chance, I may not get it right all the time, but I'm gonna wake up every day asking myself, Pat, 
what can you do to help make the lives of people in North Las Vegas better? And that's the only reason I'm running for mayor. The only reason. And we thank you. Again, this is the Independent Black Voters on Facebook. Our vote is not free. Uh, we challenge you to be educated. Look, listen, learn from all candidates. Vote your heart, but be an educated voter. Thank you again, uh, Senator Spearman. We appreciate you. your time and your efforts to tell us about who you are. Thank you. Thank you. And I wasn't yelling because I was mad. I just, I get excited.